I, I think it's in the spirit of what we're doing to, we're all coming at this from different perspectives and might've had different ideas coming in, but we, five of us work together to find a, a slate of four applicants that we could unanimously recommend to you, our fellow committee members to approve. So happy to uh, take any questions about the process or decision-making either before or after public comment um, and be as transparent as possible. Well, we really hope that tonight we'll vote to uh, approve, to fill the four vacant spots with uh, these individuals. And I want to, before uh, turning over, uh, give my fellow committee members a chance to add anything they want to add. And I see Brad already has his, uh, his hand up. So I'll uh, turn over to Brad. Well, I just wanted to echo everything that Will said. And, you know, honestly, when we first started this out, I think we all thought it's, it's going to be very difficult because we had so many great applicants. Plus, we all have come from different places, and, and but we strove for consensus, which means compromise. And, and compromise is not a bad word. Compromise is a good word when you work together with the community. And uh, at least three of us, maybe more, only got one of our four on the committee and that was that was just the way it was and I, we i think it's a it's a precursor of what's going to happen on this committee it's lots of hard discussions but yet uh, building relationships so that we can really work together and come to a, a, a common good and, and honestly there were so many people that were very suited to do this but this is what we came up with and we all endorse that and stand behind these decisions. So uh, I don't know if any other committee members want to jump in, but just my understanding the process from here. Uh, oh, uh, Matthew, this guy. Yeah, I'd really just like to um, reiterate what Brad and Will have said is that this wasn't like a majority vote situation. This was when everyone agreed it was full consensus. And yes, it did get a little bit hot in the decision-making process, but at the end of the day, like everybody on that ad hoc committee fully supports these four people. I'll also uh, agree with all of that. And I think we were all pretty pleasantly surprised when you know we kind of at the deadline uh, we're all in agreement um, on these four people. And um, you know, a lot of people put in a lot of hours, uh, volunteer hours, um, putting this together. So uh, I want everybody to uh, understand that and how difficult it was and how many uh, qualified people um, there were that applied to this. Um, there you know, was some, I, I brought up some concerns during the process um, like comments that were, were made during public comment. Um, I you know, brought up the fact that uh, was this outreach done in Spanish to find community members that Spanish is their first language to apply? Um, was the application itself, if, if somebody were to want to apply um, in Spanish? I, I Please correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't think uh, that was the case. Um, so I, I expressed that in private and, and wanted to express it in public. Um, and going along the lines with some of, you know, the other work we have to do on the meeting with coming up with understandings and um, our kind of rules uh, that, that we'll be operating under, um, you know, it was unclear what, what we were asked to do was come up with names. Um, it was decided, you know, at the city staff level that one of the people that we picked for an interview wouldn't have an interview. Um, there was some concern about that, about, you know, what, where does the authority lie? Is it in us as a subcommittee or us as in a full committee? Is it with the city staff? And I just hope that without going into all the details um, that um, we, you know, collectively come up with those agreements and decide how, um, you know, decisions will be made and, and agreed upon uh, moving forward. And thank you for, for all the all the, the work that the subcommittee did. And, and yeah, as it was mentioned, I got to know them a little bit better and, and thoroughly enjoyed that. So thank you. So Will? And um, I, unless Dan has anything to add, my understanding is um, there's an opportunity now if anyone has clarifying questions, but I think we're about to hear public comment and then have a fuller discussion and then uh, make our decision. Yeah, 
That sounds great. So what I would like to do is once again, thanks Will and everybody else. Um, I certainly know how that was, it was a long process and I um, continue to be very grateful for all the work that you put in. Um, so for anyone who's in our audience who would like to make comment during this, um, on this particular agenda item, these four proposed at-large community members, uh, we will open that public comment period now. And for our committee, we'll come to you after that um, for any discussion that's necessary before we take a vote. So if you're interested in making public comment on the four at-large community members recommendation, please raise your hand. And we will do the three minutes. Scotty, are you able to, I will stop sharing so that you can share. And Carol. Yes, um, I just have a question about, you know, how we can stay involved. Uh, I may not have understood because I may not have listened carefully, but I do want to stay involved as a citizen because I was on the uh, original uh, group of, um, I'm going to call it a consortium of groups that were working on the um, plan for the uh, Citizens Review Board and the Independent Auditor Plan. So um, are, they, are we going to be uh, notified when you're having meetings and then we can have public comment, you know, so that we can see what you're doing. And then if we have ideas, we can um, add to the conversation at that time. I would like a little explanation of how that will work if you don't mind. That's it. Yeah, great. Thank you. Um, I will just very briefly, um, I know we're not doing like a back and forth, but Carol, yes, uh, we are actively working on, on creative ways to engage community um, that are not sort of formally part of the working group. So um, encourage you to continue to offer us your feedback and we will continue to try to be creative. Uh, we already have plans for our meetings over the next few months, which I'll be talking more about later. And Kate, before okay. we move forward, I, I just think right now is a really good time for us to reiterate that the comments that you make and suggestions that you give are, are honestly being um, thought about and sought to be implemented um, with equity in mind for everyone that's in the community. And so even though some things may not be in place right now, they will be in place at some point. Um, so we really appreciate those comments. Okay, Bianca. Um, yes, thank you. I appreciate uh, seeing uh, three, uh, what I, I guess, I'm not sure of their sexual orientation or if that matters, but um, three names that I, I appreciate being on there. I would, um, I'm concerned about what Tom shared in the process. Um, I hope to see more transparency um, within the group and that uh, you guys outline with the committee what the process and rules and expectations are. I think that's part of the plan today for agreements. Um, and that it's not the city who is trying to guide the group, but that it is the committee who is coming up with the agreements. Um, uh, I'm really concerned about um, some of the processes and the steps that the city has been taking. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else who would like to make public comment in regards to the four at large community members that are being recommended? Okay, very good. So, um, What I would love uh, now is for the Forward Together Committee, if there's anyone who has questions for our work group, any discussion that needs to have, and once we've done that, we will entertain a motion. Linda Mayo, yeah. Okay, I was just wondering if, uh, I know it had to be really hard to do, but I was wondering if you had very many applicants that uh, were family members of someone with a serious mental illness. 
So I can, I'm, I'm waiting to see if, it, yeah, Will, please. No, no, Kate, go in. I was, I was cracking my mind. What, yeah. what I would offer is that based, um, and, and I believe, um, I know that you can't tell this from the lists that we would send out, but we know we had at least one. Um, and that, that's, I can share that that much. Thank you. Mr. Anguiano, did you, I saw your hand up, but yeah. Okay, go. I unmuted. Well, thank, thanks to the committee for the work you've done. I think the list reflects one of the concerns that was addressed of not having that many women on the committee. As far as the Latino Community Roundtable, we had designated a woman to participate in this committee, but she was unable to serve. So therefore I'm here. And then if there's no more comments, I make a motion to approve the list and that these uh, four uh, nominated members become members of the committee. Thank you, sir. If there are no other comments, we'll entertain a second. I will second it, Brad. Thanks, Brad. And then I believe Leslie's gonna roll call. Karen Anguiano, motion. Yes. Okay. Leah Ashford. Yes. Josh Bridegroom. Yes. Trish Christensen. Yes. Birgit Flatiker. Adriana Garcia. Yes. Jonathan Gramatico. Yes. Brad Hahn. Yes. Thomas Helm. Yes. Ruben Imperial. Yes. Will Kelly. Yes. Matthew Mason. Yes. Linda Mayo. Yes. <laughs> okay. Perfecto Munoz. Yes. Sergeant Starr. Dan Starr. Yes. Thank you. Lieutenant Tate. Yes. Tim Zierley. Yes. Thank you. Back over to you, Kate. Excellent. Well, congratulations right. on um, our taking our first vote on something. Right. Um, and again, I can't, I really can't say enough about the time that went into uh, making these decisions. And um, as someone who ran tech support for the 14 interviews that we did, um, I can just really back up what the ad hoc group is saying about the quality of applicants um, that's what made the decision as hard as it was. It was just um, really moving in many moments, actually. Um, so very grateful for the interest in participating. We'll make sure that there's lots of ways, as I said to Carol, um, for folks to stay engaged. More, more on that to come. Edgar, I see your hand up. Did we miss something? No, we just want to let you know that we'll be promoting uh, the four additional members into the meeting space. So we may want to hold for a few seconds before moving on to the next item. You bet. Yeah. So give us a second. Hi, Marion. Hello, Solange. Hi, Nico. Do we have Teresa yet? Great. Welcome. Indeed. All right, Mike, it's all you. All right, welcome. So let us welcome our new members. Um, and we can probably do that just by a, a something with the, <laughs> something relaxed. So we want to welcome Marion Martino, Salaj Altman, um, Nico Solario, 
Teresa Gamboa, and we also welcomed Adriana. And so with that, you know, one of the things that is customary for us to do is for, I'm gonna ask you at some point in the next minute or two, for you to share your name, who you are, um, and who you bring into the room with you. And you guys notice that um, there's this, this chair, and since we're not in a physical space, for me to bring the chair out, um, we, we've been blessed with Kate to have this chair. And this chair represents those people who we represent, who we bring into the room with us. We don't, none of us want to be in this space without remembering the people who are counting on us to have a voice for them. And then we want to remember that, you know, we all um, come into this space becoming examples for those people. So we may have to be an example of how to work with people who have a different viewpoint than ours, who we may have to represent and mirror to them what that looks like, because they may not have an experience of that, you know. And so we, we want to bring in these individuals with us when we come in, that we're not here by ourselves. None of us get to this space by ourselves. And so we want to remember them as we um, do this important work. So I want to ask Miriam if you can tell us um, your name. And who do you bring in a room with you, whether that's your organization or who you represent or something else? It's really up to you to decide who it is that you bring into the room with you. Hi, thank you, Michael. So um, I'm a 40 plus year resident of Modesto. I've served on various committees in, um, in the area, the State Theater, um, Center for Human Services. I've been on their board, uh, the Stanislaus Community Foundation. I'm a past president of the Modesto Rotary Club. I'm currently the chair of the San, uh, Stanislaus County Juvenile Justice Commission. I'm happy to serve that role. I've been a 10 plus year volunteer in Juvenile Hall. So as mentioned, I uh, bring with me justice involved youth and at risk youth. I'm um, a daughter, I'm a sister to five brothers. I'm an aunt to 15 nieces and nephews, 10 great nieces and nephews now. I'm uh, the wife to Joanna. I'm a retired business owner, a 38 year career in graphic design and uh, communications. I am uh, an avid pickleball player, which has nothing to do with much, but you know that now. Um, my goal is to be a servant leader and I'm humbled to, uh, to serve with this group and I'm looking forward to working with you. Thank you, Mary, welcome. Um, Solange, Solange Altman, can you um, share with us? Um, hi, can you hear me? Yes. Um, hi, um, my name is Solange Gonsalves Altman. I always use all three names. I was originally uh, born in Brazil and um, I moved to Modesto in 1984 to work as a staff attorney for California Rural Legal Assistance, where I represented low income um, people in a variety of, of matters, um, housing, health, education, employment matters, civil rights matters. I did that for more than nine years. And then I went into private practice and represented um, clients in connection with immigration matters. Um, most of my clients were Latino. I um, speak Spanish and Portuguese pretty fluently. Um, and um, during the course of um, my representation of uh, immigrants, um, I had the opportunity to hear about many interactions with the police. And um, that's what made me interested in being part of this committee. And in addition to my work with CRLA and, uh, and uh, as an immigration attorney, I, I also worked for El Concilio as their immigration services director for more than four and a half years. So I have public interest, private practice experience and have been involved in the community in a number of ways and served on um, lots of different committees. I've been really active and was very active in educational issues. When my children were going through um, Modesto City Schools, I married to Steve Altman, who's an attorney, and I have two children who are adults now, and my daughter now is a staff attorney with California Rural Legal Assistance. Um, anyway, I, um, I'm not going to take time up here, but the comments that were made about Spanish translation, I, I almost feel like translating what I just said into Spanish, but since the rest of this meeting hasn't been translated, I'm, I'm not going to do that for the sake of time, but um, I agree that that 
that's something that needs to be provided and taken care of. Um, anyway, thank you for um, selecting me to be on this committee. And I, I hope to be um, fair, thorough, and um, to really delve into issues that are concerned to the community and hope that we can come to um, help come to a um, man meaningful resolution of a lot of the issues that we have and make the relationship between the police and, and our citizens better. Thank you. Thank you, Solange. Welcome. Nico Solario. Hello, uh, my name is Nico Solorio. Um, I am 28 years old and I recently um, graduated from a Latino leadership initiative where I learned a lot of my skills um, that I know I can bring with me to this committee. So I'm really, I'm excited and I'm hopeful that we can all work together and um, move forward together in this. Um, I bring, or I actually represent just the community of Modesto and um, a lot of the constituents around here that I've listened to just through the part of towns that I've lived in, um, you know, in the south side of Modesto, the west side of Modesto, and listening to the community at large and what they are seeking from um, our policing. Um, and who I bring in the room with me is my six sisters, my two brothers, um, my stepfather who um, was uh, Oakland Police Department, um, served in the military. Um, I bring my family with me and um, I think about them a lot for this. So I just really wanna thank you guys for this opportunity and I'm really excited. All right, welcome Nico, thank you. And Teresa Gamboa. Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Teresa Gamboa. Thank you for accepting me on to this uh, work group. I consider it a great honor. I am the chairwoman of Woodland West Community Neighborhood. I also coordinate the largest neighborhood watch group in the city of Modesto. Um, I've been active in the city and the county on various committees and groups. And um, I was part of the homeless engagement when that first started. And it got me involved with a lot of homeless people. So who I bring into the room with me is my community, um, all the different communities of Modesto, the homeless community and the law enforcement community. And I'm hopeful that through this work group, we can build stronger relationships and greater trust to resolve a lot of the problems that we have in our community today. Thank you, Teresa. And Thank you. we wanna also um, hear from Adriana. Um, you didn't get a chance to introduce yourself in the beginning because you came in um, as a result of a replacement. And so we'd like for you to share with us also um, who you bring in the room with you and who you are. Yes, thank you. I, I appreciate that. Um, I know my husband is actually really bummed out that he couldn't um, be part of this, but um, it is definitely, definitely my gain. Um, I, I volunteered for this and um, so, so yeah, um, my name's um, Adriana Garcia. Uh, my husband and I are heavily involved with the Central Valley Hispanic Chamber of Commerce. He is actually the CEO and president. Um, I am the chair advisory board uh, for, for the CVHCC, also the chair for the ambassador program that we have. Um, I, like Nico, um, graduated from the Latino um, Leadership Initiative um, that city ministry put together um, to equip, you know, people that look like me um, to, to be able to be in places like this and, and be able to voice our, our opinions and, and our thoughts and our experiences. Um, I am also on the board for city ministry, um, on the board for Love Modesto. Uh, my husband and I also own a insurance agency, Got It All Insurance Agency. And um, I work for a nonprofit um, organization that helps with, um, youth learning healthy, healthy relationships. So um, who do I bring in the room with me? Um, 
community. I bring from, you know, youth um, to above. <laughs> um, I immigrated to, to um, the United States. Um, so I feel like I have, you know, a lot um, to be thankful for, um, the opportunities that I have, um, the blessings that I've encountered. And I definitely want to always and try to always um, help um, the, the community and, and to better them just as, as um, I've try to, to better myself, um, not just for me, but to um, also for my kids. I have two children, a boy and a girl. So it's, it's very important to me, um, you know, women empowerment for my daughter, but also, um, you know, fairness for, for our young men. And, and um, yeah, so that's a little bit about, about me. All right, thank you. Thank you, welcome. Um, was if there's anyone else that was not present during our first meeting, can you raise your hand so that we might um, not miss you having an opportunity to share with us who it is that you represent, who you bring into the room with you? We don't want to miss anyone. So we have Leah, you wasn't present at the first meeting? That's correct. Yep. Feel free um, to share your name and organization or who you represent. And who do you bring in a room with you? Okay. Um, <clears throat> so yes, my name is Leah Ashford and I am here on behalf of City Ministry Network. I'm on their board. I work with uh, Marvin Jacobo and Joe Duran and, and working to help bring people together to collaborate and advocate on behalf of our some of our more vulnerable communities here in uh, Modesto and our county. And um, I previously worked at Gallo for 20 years in their HR and training and development department. And now, as Kate was saying, I'm a consultant and coach working with local nonprofits. And uh, I bring into the room with me my community, um, people I know in my family who've um, had some difficult interactions at times with uh, policing, but looking to see how we can uh, make an impact and make that better for everyone. And uh, just looking forward to working with all of you. I love the diversity that we have here of backgrounds and people. And uh, anyway, I, I'm glad I have the chance to be part of this. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Leah. And Jonathan? Yes, hi. I was not at the first meeting. I apologize for that. I had one of my uh, board members, Ronica Ambrose, uh, make it to that, but I'm glad to be part of this one. Uh, my name is Jonathan Gramatico. My, pro uh, my pronouns are he, him, his. Um, I am the current president for the Modesto Pride Center. Um, so that kind of speaks to the organization and community that kind of bring with me represent. Um, I think more important than that is um, I come from a background of poverty. Um, I've had my fair share of police interactions um, with family and otherwise. Um, speaking more about Mo Pride, um, what we do extends beyond the LGBTQ community. Um, we work with a lot of um, people who use substances. Um, we have homeless and houseless people that are coming in for our clothing closet and our um, food closet, uh, food pantry and things like that. Um, and I currently work as a therapist at a private practice. So I kind of bring in some of that um, mental health background as well. So. All right, thank you. Thank you. Thank you all for being here. And we have a responsibility. Um, and so we're gonna move forward. In the Actually, time. Mike, I see yeah. that uh, Aaron Tate also. Oh, okay. Let's see. Yeah, Aaron Tate. Thank you. How are you guys doing? Uh, my name is Aaron Tate. I'm a Lieutenant with the Modesto Police Department. I'm um, a little bit about my background. Um, I also um, grew up in poverty, first one to graduate college in my uh, family, um, which then launched me into the career of law enforcement. And then through law enforcement, um, I rose in the ranks and I currently represent the Modesto Police Department. I oversee the Internal Affairs Division and Criminal Intelligence Unit. So uh, when it comes to accountability and policies, um, that's what I'm here for is to represent the organization. Well, thank you, Aaron. We really appreciate you being here. And with that said, we're gonna move forward. And remember, yes, we we're not gonna see the chair in the middle of the room or in the middle of, middle of the Zoom, but we wanna remember throughout the rest of this process that we have people that are counting on us. Indeed.
Okay, we're gonna do two more agenda items and then we're gonna give people a chance to stretch um, because we sometimes need that even more when we're in a virtual world. Um, so I want to just offer a couple of announcements uh, real quick about where we're headed. So um, in the first meeting, we had talked a little bit about um, a vision that Mike and I had brought forward around having subgroups, which we understand creates some uh, concern for folks, this idea that if we didn't have the full working group together, we wouldn't be required to be uh, open to the public. So we're navigating that and ultimately, um, what we did want to just declare is that the next three meetings um, are going to be our educational meetings. We'll be doing the work after the break today, deciding what kinds of information, presentations, speakers, and so on you might want to hear from. But over the next three months until the end of the calendar year, our time together will be about learning. So in October, we will be focused on policies and procedures and doing a bunch of learning and asking questions during that meeting. In November, we'll be focused on the um, the sort of bucket of alternative response models. And then in December, we'll be focused on the issue of accountability. In January, it's our intention to host a couple of listening sessions. These will be different than the one that, um, although aligned, but different than the one that the city council hosted at the beginning of this process. This will be for the work group itself for all of you um, so that we can invite the public to come certainly after hopefully having heard all these presentations during um, our educational time together um, to offer more of their perspective and questions that they may still have or ideas that they want to bring forward. Um, as we reach the end of the calendar year, we'll revisit the calendar and the process moving forward and we'll continue to keep people updated, but we use the word emerging calendar on purpose because uh, as I'm sure you may already know or um, you will find out, <laughs> change is not a linear process and uh, there's no recipe for this, so we want to stay flexible, um, as flexible as we can. So the other thing I need to say for the work group is um, that the first meeting we asked folks to volunteer for the role of chair and co-chair. We did have a couple of people come forward. Um, although because our group was not complete, meaning we had not selected our four at-large community members, it felt uh, like it would be the responsible choice for us to come back to this group and once again say, we are looking for two people to chair this committee. Um, we believe that it would include some light facilitation, meaning you might open and close the meetings, you would facilitate us through the public comment period, uh, and just generally move us through agenda items. Obviously, Mike and I and any of our presenters would be the ones filling in all the content. Uh, we do also believe that if you were to chair this committee, you would work with Mike and I to develop the agendas moving forward and that there might be opportunities to be a spokesperson that would might be speak with the media, for instance, on behalf of this group. So um, we can certainly take volunteers now. You could use the raise your hand function if it's just the thing you've been waiting to do your entire life. Um, you can also give the gift to someone else um, by nominating them for the role. Of course, nobody has to do anything. Um, and as we will make a practice, um, we will be sending out this information in an email follow-up after this meeting that would include you know, what Mike shared about the League of Women Voters, a reminder that we're taking nominations or volunteers for the chair uh, responsibilities. And then our plan will be to vote on the chair and vice chair positions in the October meeting. Mr. Aaron Anguiano, are you volunteering or are you gonna do the honor of nominating someone? Uh, no, I would not volunteer to chair. It's such an important role, but I would nominate Thomas Helm for chairman. Okay, noted. Thank you. Matthew Mason. I would also like to nominate Thomas Helm. Got it. Oh, thank you. Tom also has the option of saying no, but we can talk about that later. <laughs> Uh, others? Okay. So we have some um, names for consideration and we will, um, I'm gonna just be checking in with folks to make sure that that's still something that they're interested in. Um, and then we'll bring that to the next meeting for us to vote and get some chair people 
um, in that in that role. Okay. So this is our last agenda item, and then I promise we're going to take a break. Um, one thing I just wanted to make a comment about, and then I'm going to give this to Mike, though, is that one of the themes that continues to arise in our work, meaning Mike and I, um, and also like with the ad hoc group and so on, is the need for us to be in relationship with each other. So, um, and I don't mean like we'll go out for lunch together and those types of things, although no one's stopping you if you want to, um, but that we're more likely to be willing to be influenced by one another, right? If we feel more connected to one another. And I think we saw that play out with the ad hoc group. Um, and that one of the reasons Mike so beautifully invites people to do their introductions and the reason we spend time in that space is because it's important for us to see each other, right? As human beings who represent whole groups and populations of people. Um, and that if we make this business all the time and we just get straight to work, that often doesn't result in really lasting sustainable change work. So that relationship building is an expectation that Mike and I will try to weave through any design that we have influence over and certainly encourage all of you um, to be connecting with one another as it's appropriate within these experiences and outside of these experiences, getting to know one another, asking questions, being curious. Um, it, it's going to make this process better. So Mike, you're muted, sir. Yeah, I can't agree more. I mean, you know, building relationships is an important part of what we're doing. But in order for us to build relationships, sometimes we need to have a healthy environment that we can work in. And this is where we, we unanimously agree on some group agreements. The group agreements will give us our framework that we can operate in with each other. And so, and with this process. And that means that the way that we operate, not just while we're here, but even when we're outside of these meetings. So on and off the court, so to speak. So one of the things, we, we got a few of them that we kind of like initiated just to get us started. And so some of those group agreements that we want to start with may be um, something like we stay at the table. No matter what happens, no matter how intense the conversation, no matter if if we feel like our opinion isn't being validated, we stay at the table. We wanna, can we all agree by a short hands, that by, the, by the short of the hand, the raise your hand factor, are you willing to stay at the table no matter what? We need this I to would, be one of the group agreements that we yeah, can- Yeah, and I would just offer Mike real quickly to you that like, as Mike and I have, we're putting these up here as a place for us to start, but you all can tell us to take them down also. Absolutely, right? Because this process is, is yours. And so we, we look like we have a unanimous that we're all willing to stay at the table, right? So by knowing this and seeing this, we can hold each other to account for this, you know? So if we, at some point, someone feels like they're leaving the table, we have the responsibility of reminding them of the agreement that they've made, because these are group agreements, not individual agreements, they're group agreements. And then we wanna expect to be in discomfort. Comfort is really overrated. When we're being challenged and stressed, we can expect to experience discomfort. Another one, um, we wanna be able to call each other in and not out. We wanna call each other into the conversation and not call each other out of the conversation or not call each other on things that we, ne we necessarily may, may disagree on. We want to call each other in. Kay, can you give us an example of calling each other in? Yeah, what I would just offer is that that's language we use as a way to create a culture of feedback. So if Mike does something in a meeting that feels like an ouch, like he's done something to offend me, if I adhere to these group agreements, my approach could be in the meeting or outside of the meeting to come to him and say, hey, can we talk about something that happened in that meeting that landed in not an okay way with me? Or, and he's gonna be open to that, but I'm calling him in to that conversation versus the sort of culture we sometimes have of calling people out, which creates more distance between people instead of less. Absolutely. And so we wanna hear from you. We, we need to hear from you because these group, group agreements are yours, right? They're for all of us. And so what are we missing? What should we add to these group agreements? 
What do you need in order for you to be able to be transparent, at times vulnerable, um, to, to feel heard? What do you need? And you can unmute yourself and let's, let's get to it. For me, it, it, what helps me stay on task with things when you're dealing with very difficult things is to remember that I think generally all of us want the same thing. We want a healthy community. We want a police force that works with the community. We want to be safe. How we get there is going to, we're going to argue about and wrestle in, in a good way for a lot, for a long time. But when I have trouble with somebody like, I'll use Marion. She's right in the middle of my screen. If I have trouble with her, I go talk to her about it and say, Marion, we're, uh, you know, I, I want to believe that your goal is the same as mine. How, how are you, you know, working? How is this working for you? And, and the other thing for me is disagreement is normal. I've been married 45 years and my wife still disagrees with me. And so how do I expect this group here to agree with everything that I have to say or, or anybody else? So it's okay to disagree. It's just, as long as we keep our goal, our mind on the goal of, of all of us are genuinely desiring for a better community. And I, I think that, that that helps. I'm just sharing with you what keeps me on task because I can get off the rail's pretty easy and rant and rave and stuff. I usually don't do it in public, but sometimes I will. You know? but, <laughs> so if I heard you correctly, you said you want us to basically keep the end in mind and you want us to have, we all agree that we, you, you basically said that you want, we all want a safe and healthy community and that it's okay to disagree. Yep. Are these okay for us to leave up as group agreements? We can add them or take them down as we need to see as we feel fit. Nico, and then Linda. And I can't see everyone at the same time. So if, if I don't call you according to the way you raise your hand, please don't take offense. Sorry, I was just agreeing with, um, with what he was okay. saying. Okay, excellent, yeah. excellent. Did you have anything to add? Um, not at this moment. All right, thank you. Linda? Um, yeah, I would just like to say it would be, it's really important for me to find compassion for all of the different people that we're bringing to that chair. And we don't all know how it is to walk in those people's shoes, but I think that can help a lot in fostering uh, trust and, <clears throat> and a ability to work together if you show compassion for each other's uh, place that people that you're bringing into the room. Excellent, excellent. You reminded me of a really um, important point is, you know, like sh showing compassion and empathy is, in, is, is really critical and looking to be understanding before we look to be understood. If we look to be understanding, then chances are we're gonna deploy compassion and experience empathy as we look to understand before we look to be understood. This isn't an easy time for any of us. And we're gonna be tackling some um, sometimes difficult subjects and difficult issues that are not easy to talk about. But with these group agreements, this is what we wanna deploy is these, the group agreements that can help us have those conversations. Matthew, do you have something to add? Uh, yes, I'd like to also um, encourage a bit of a practice of stepping up and stepping back. Uh, so like if you're a very, um, if you're a very, talkative person, maybe in discussions, like say what you need to say, but bear in mind that other people have stuff to say, so step back. And if you recognize that you're not a particularly talkative person, say what you need to say, and don't be afraid of stepping up and making space in the room for yourself. Excellent, excellent, thank you for that. Edgar, did Edgar have his hand up? No. I, I did, sorry about that, Michael. Um, Tim's yearly lost connection. Can can we please promote him? Kate. Kate. Yep. Okay. Adriana, can you share with us? I was just going to say accountability, um, doing what you said you're going to do. Um, I think if that doesn't get done, the, 
you know, you start building up tension. Excellent, excellent point. Thank you for that. So do what you say you're gonna do. Right? Hold yourself accountable and each other. Right. Excellent. Any other group agreements? Is there anything missing? We're looking to create a safe container. Is the qualities that you need as an individual up there? Josh, Josh Bridegroom. Can you guys hear me? Yes, sir. Oh, you you cut out for a second there. Um, I you know I just I think it's important to, to bear in mind that there, as we're pushing through this together, um, there are no wrong um, ideas um, or wrong comments that anybody can share as long as they're made in the interest of moving this this uh, discussion forward. They're they're welcome. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you for that, Josh. You bet. Like, no wrong comments. You know, it's so important for us to recognize that we all come from different places in our life. And so our perspective, our point of view may be different. It doesn't make it wrong or right. It's just ours. And we, we need each other's ideas. Is there anything else that's missing? Anyone else have anything else that they'd like to share as part of our group agreements? These are the agreements that will hold us together. When also sometimes, add, mm -hmm. I'm sorry, Michael, I would just yeah, add to you that, that they're living, right? So we could discover in a meeting or two that there's something we need to add here. So Absolutely. this won't be the last, the last time. Looks like Solange has something to add. Go right ahead, Solange. Um, I was just going to add that um, our work needs to be done in as open and a transparent, as transparent a manner as possible to have the trust of the community. Absolutely. And you know, I'm, I'm so glad you mentioned that because as community leaders and as individuals that come into the room representing others, um, it's so important for us to be willing to be vulnerable, for them to see what vulnerability looks like. In our day and time, sometimes when we have opposing viewpoints, we can we can lack the ability to be vulnerable or the willingness to be vulnerable, especially when we're in a fishbowl, right? And so that transparency, although it's really critical, just as critical as our ability to be flexible and vulnerable um, and compassionate, because those are traits that we, we really want to mirror to the community. Can I ask, Michael, because you just used some words um, yes. that I'm not totally seeing up here. And I, it's a real question, but words like being flexible, um, being vulnerable. Uh, I know that curiosity is one that I often try to bring into rooms that we come from a learning, a place of wanting to learn. So I'm just offering that if there's anyone who wants to turn that into a group agreement. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for highlighting that. Uh, I'll add that we each attempt to listen with tolerance, acceptance, and patience. Excellent. I, I think this is included in a lot of this, um, but I was looking for the, that word respect. So I think it, a lot of it comes down to having mutual respect for everybody um, and respect for each other's experiences. You know, we're, we're just a lot of the times we're a collection of our experiences and we have a point of view um, because we experience something that others may not have experienced. So as long as we're being respectful to the fact that, okay, I see where you're coming from because, um, you know, that's what your experience is. I, I think that's really important. And somebody made the point um, about, you know, kind of no wrong ideas or comments. I, uh, I, I think, you know, I like to use the phrase it, good faith um, when people are making a good faith argument when there's not, you know, an agenda behind it, when they're just, um, you know, that, that, that's, it's kind of the same thing as, you know, there's no wrong ideas or comments if it's coming from a place of, of good faith and respect. That's all. I'm not sure those can be just put into the bullet points, but just uh, some thoughts. Yeah. I got some of it. And Tom, I just wanted to um, make a connection because I do think that we're all saying very similar things, but there's there's some distinct differences between some of the things that we're offering too. But, you know, this idea of no wrong ideas, um, listening with tolerance, acceptance, you know, it's okay to disagree. 
we're talking about what kind of environment we want to create. And then ultimately, you know, this idea that we would call each other in because we're going to say stuff that doesn't feel good or you're going to hear things that don't feel good. And what we do with it matters. Yeah. Ruben? Hi. Yeah, I, I would recommend it. I'm, I don't have the outline for here, but just definitely as I, you know, I think most of the comments here is anticipating that, yeah, we'll have difficult conversations and divergence will be inevitable. I think um, as facilitators, maybe um, to just have some agreement or at least um, alert us to um, at some point, how, how would you as facilitators uh, manage these conversations so that we're, we're aware of it and we um, can participate and understand what's happening, um, especially if, you know, the, the, as challenges get more, as discussions get more challenging, um, just, just an agreement on how as a group we would um, deal with um, divergence and work through divergence together. Um, I, I think the last part is um, a commitment to work through that divergence. Um, right. And first part was just, maybe it'd be good to help, it may be helpful to define a process and how we would actually deal with it as facilitators and name it as even it's occurring and, and be, be okay with that. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Ruben. You know, one of the things that we encourage is to give yourself permission to feel whatever shows up, to feel and experience whatever shows up, because, you know, we're going to have some difficult or high emotional subjects that are going to come up and we all can be passionate about our particular viewpoints. So just being willing to experience those things. Um, perfecto. Um, yes, um, what I would like to offer is that as we prepare ourselves for this journey, that we start beginning to, we need to keep in mind the objectives or outcomes. What, what's, the, what's the expectation of this, pro, of this particular task force or this committee in terms of meeting a specific timeline and goals? And how, where does this information go to into the city or the council? Um, I believe that that's key to success by understanding what your deliverables are. The other thing is that we have to have some real strong indicators. You have outcomes, but you have to have indicators on how you're gonna achieve those outcomes. And I believe that um, that's something that we all have to understand that we're gonna to have to come to some um, confusion of how we meet those objectives and one of the things I always think about when I look at um, outcomes is setting agendas, setting a plan, setting objectives, setting goals on how we're going to meet a specific area in terms of the needs. And I believe that that's what we need to focus on. The city is a big city. It's a very diverse city. I, I'm from the, I represent the West Side because of my working there and have been there for a while and understanding the voices that come to me every day regarding challenges is gonna be key for me to be able to offer this group an insight of what individuals are faced with in both either the West and South Modesto. So right. we need to keep those in mind. And I believe that if we have those um, principles in mind, we're going. We, this committee will begin to drive um, system changes to hopefully to benefit the community as a whole. Thank you, Perfecto. So we're gonna take one last comment and, and we're gonna sit with what we have. Um, but Thomas, we're gonna invite you to share your comment if you can be brief. Yeah, sorry, one more thing. I'm looking for those words like respect that I didn't see and that the second one that came to mind and it was, it was just touched on was inclusiveness. Um, I think it goes along with the openness and transparency. Um, you know, the, I think the whole reason why we said we're doing this is to, to better those community police relationships. So I think having an open and transparent process is going to be a big part of that. Uh, it also needs to be inclusive. So we're doing this under, you know, the city council, uh, which is, you know, democratically elected body, um, you know, striving to have those opportunities for public comment. Um, which is good. And I think, um, like has been mentioned a few times, that the translation and interpretation of a, a, a large group of our community that we live in yes. um, that yes. might speak a different language. So inclusiveness of, of, of all community members. Absolutely. 
thanks for those comments. And so what we want to do is we're committing um, of how we're going to be working together. And we're going to call each other in and not out. And we're going to expect and be in, expect to be in discomfort. We're going to stay at the table. We're going to keep the end in mind. We want um, a safe and healthy community. These are things that we all agree upon. It's absolutely okay to disagree. We want to show compassion and empathy in order to walk a mile in someone else's shoes. You first have to take your shoes off. Um, we want to step up and step back. Do what you say you're going to do. Be accountable. No wrong ideas or comments as long as they are in service to our shared work. We want to assume good intentions. We will be open and transparent with each other and the community. We want to be inclusive. We want to listen with tolerance, acceptance, and patience. We want to show respect for each other and for our individual experiences. And we want to have and continue to have clear deliverables. We want to work with the end in mind. All right, there we go. So we have those group agreements. These are the things that we'll, um, and how we'll use them. Kate? Yeah, so just real quick, and then we're going to take a break. Um, so this is a, a living document, as I've said, so we can make changes. You can sit with these for a while and decide that doesn't feel right. It needs to be changed. We're not going to get lost in it, but that's like you can just communicate with Mike and I about that. We're going to bring them forward at every meeting um, and encourage all of you to contribute to a culture of feedback that you use these when it feels like something isn't uh, happening in a way that we might imagine or something feels misaligned that this list become a place where you know Matthew can say to Solange hey you know we agreed as a group that we were going to do this and that's not what I'm observing or I'm really struggling with this and that we're able to communicate when, and give feedback to one another uh, both in these meetings and outside of it just a couple last things our work will happen in this meeting but it will happen in just as many ways outside of this meeting so I'm inviting all of us to see us as being in this work all the time which is why we're very clear that when we invite you to commit to these ways of working together this process starts to fall apart when we start behaving in different ways outside like Mike said off the court right so we're inviting people to be thinking about working in this way all the time and then the last thing i want to say is that as a facilitator um, i just offer this perspective change work doesn't generally fall apart because process is bad i know that process can break things or make things ineffective but when we as human beings don't we aren't responsive to that process we don't take in feedback well we don't come from a place of, as Tom said, assuming best intentions, we don't address conflict in ways that are productive, that's when things really start to fall apart. So it is about how we show up as human beings. And I'm inviting all of you to, to really embody these group agreements and take that very seriously. This is not gonna happen uh, to us, it's gonna happen through us. And that means we need to work in certain ways. So, uh, we'll bring these back to our next meeting we'll also send them out in an email and for right now what we'd like to do is invite people to take a five minute break when we come back we're going to be doing our exploration around what kind of data information you want to see over the next three months so it is um i'll just say it's technically it's 703 we'll pretend it's 704 and um invite all of you guys and now it is 704 um yeah. please can, can you share can you share a timer so that we all know that um when to come right back I will find a timer or Scotty can find a timer, but either way, I'm also going to trust that at 709, people's cameras are going to come back on. We're going to get Absolutely. back to work. That's 709. Great. All right. Break time.
All right, I'd love to start welcoming people back. Appreciating Birgit and Tim with their cameras on for those who can. Hi, Matt. Let's us know that you're ready. Hi, Nico. Josh, Marion. So we'll assume that folks are getting settled once again. Hi, Leah. Will. I wonder if it encourages people to turn their videos on if I say their names or discourages people. Hello, Tom. Perfecto. Hi, Teresa. Call them out, Kate. I'm doing it. <laughs> Some of us can't do it because we've been stuck with a host to stop the video. So I, oh, swell. Yeah, so there. <laughs> Fixed it. Brad, I know you would have done it. Had you had the power. She's calling them in, not out. That's right. That's right. <laughs> I appreciate that Brad practiced our group agreements so early in the process. All right, everybody, <laughs> welcome back. Hi, Dan. Um, so here's what we're doing. Um, this last bit of time is going to be about you telling us what you want to know more about. So I want to offer um, a couple of things before we just invite you to unmute yourselves and ask for what you need. But if you'll recall, um, and I'll give you the descriptions of these different buckets as they were um, offered to us by the city, as the work group members, um, you've been asked to work together to make recommendations you can stand behind in regards to policing in Modesto. So we need to know because we wanna learn things before we start making recommendations um, about what needs to happen. And as was demonstrated when we were developing our group agreements, because we all come from very different vantage points and life experiences, and we all make sense of data in different ways. And so in any change process, it's important for us to have these shared learning experiences in the context of where we live, right? With the people that we live with and work with, um, so that's what we're going to be spending the rest of this year really doing and also inviting you guys to do your own research in the time between. So we have these three buckets, policies and procedures, alternative response models and accountability. And then I have a, a section for general information. And what we're going to do is we're going to go uh, like bucket by bucket. So in a minute, I'm going to pull up a slide that talks about policies and procedures and the way the city is defining them. And I'm going to tell you, Mike and I are going to share with you what the city and the Modesto Police Department is already preparing to share. Um, we're gonna be having you know, virtual and for those who need handheld binders available to people, we'll post information on the website and so on. Um, but we want you to look at what we're offering, certainly ask questions. I know Chief Gillespie is here. We also have Aaron and Dan, if there are questions about what AB something or other means, um, but we wanna make sure you have as much information as you need. For the people who are uh, remaining in our audience, um, I, would, I know that people are using the Q&A, we're not gonna be responding to them, um, but I would just invite you that during this particular period, if we're talking about policies and procedures and there's information that you want that we don't have on our list, please use the question and answer function to put those questions or requests in there and we'll track it so that we can make sure that um, if the work group doesn't know that they should be looking at something that you do, we wanna make sure that we're paying attention to that as well. Absolutely, and Kate, I just wanna reiterate that Although we're not answering a Q&A session right, section right now, we are taking note of what questions um, and comments are being placed in the Q&A so as to make sure that if those questions need to be answered in the future, they will be answered. Okay, so let's begin. Um, policies and procedures, and the way that the city is inviting us to think about this is policies and procedures that support safety, fairness, and equity throughout the department and community. Um, one comment I'll make, and I'll probably make it again, is that this is not the last time you'll be able to be invited to declare, you know, what information you want. We may get through the policies and procedures session, and that may result in even more questions, which is fine. But this is what we know we're going to be offering, a lot of policies within the department um, and some legislation and so on. Uh, and I'm curious, we can also create some quiet space, but when it comes to policies and procedures, what additional information or questions do you have that would help you start to think about some recommendations that you might make?
is there a, a policy about the collection of information about you know stops and interactions um with people so you you're talking about data for um stops or um yeah exactly stops and and interactions um you know how many times demographic information um geographical information yep got it and i would invite uh chief gillespie and certainly aaron yep um to we're not so one thing i do want to say before um I, I bring you guys in um i don't want us to answer questions right now unless it's a yes there's data for that or no there isn't but i don't want us to get into too much discussion because we're going to have an entire meeting dedicated to it but tom what i'm tracking is um, I heard, I'm wondering if I'm hearing two questions. One is policies that dictate what information is collected when traffic stops happen, and then also data on traffic stops disaggregated in all the ways that we might be interested. Does that feel correct? Uh, yeah, the first question would answer the second question, I guess. If, sure. If, is that data? Well, yeah, and then, but then you might want, do you want to look at it if that's available, right? Yeah, definitely. Cool. Um, okay. Can you? Can I? Add, you're saying traffic stops. I think it's any any interaction. Don't. It's yeah, not any, just just not interaction. just traffic stops. Yeah. Got right. it. Okay. Um. Yep. Aaron Tate, please. So yes, the answer is yes to that, Thomas. Um, it's in it's a, in, within these policy and, policies and audits, as far as information you're asking for. The audits that are already listed on the slide. Yep. So it's coming. Got it. Yes. Great. Um, I'm going to go to Solange and then Linda and then Nico. You're Solange, muted, you're Solange. Muted. Solange, you're muted. Here you go. There um, we go. Before you even get to the policies and procedures, um, shouldn't the question be raised whether there is a problem and if there's, you know, how do we determine if there is a problem and what the extent of the problem is? And, you know, have there been complaints? Have there been incident reports? Have there, you know, are there potential lawsuits out there? Have there been lawsuits? I mean, it kind of goes to the data collection that was just mentioned, but it, it, it seems like we need to identify the problem. And if there is a problem before we start looking at the policies and procedures, to determine if they're adequately addressing the problems that may exist. Appreciating that feedback, Solange. One thing that I would offer is that um, part of the question in this particular bucket is, do the policies and procedures support safety, fairness, and equity throughout the department and community? So in many ways, it is actually an audit of the policies as they're written. Um, but I also think that I believe that some of the audit information that you'll be receiving would also provide information about um, personnel complaints. So I'm taking some notes on the, the things that you brought up and we can certainly see about bringing more information forward to the group. If the, I hope that feels responsive. Well, perhaps, um, so let's go ahead and go to Linda and then Solange, if I, I might be misunderstanding, but I wanna make sure that um, we capture this so I may connect with you um, after we hear from some other folks or after the meeting. Linda? Okay, um, I know there are certain laws about um, police response to mental health crisis and 5150s. I'd like to see, I would think that there's policies and procedures in in those kinds of instances as well. And I'd like to see that. Great. Thanks, Linda. Thank you. Uh, Nico. Um, I would like to see um, if there's any policies or procedures on like the actual training that the officers are receiving, um, how they're being trained, what they're being taught um, during their training. Um, if there's any information on that. You bet. Excellent, excellent. Aaron? Well, I was thinking, can we be provided a uh, binder with all the policies and procedures of the police department? And then we can find 
things or questions to ask because like this is just like a general talk but how are we going to get into the nitty-gritty about the policies and procedures and what's wrong with them if anything maybe nothing's wrong we just need to execute them yeah so that is and i appreciate the question um and that is the plan that we would be able to gather as much of the information as possible and provide it to you and up to you, either a binder or electronically, and allow you to start to look through that prior to the session in October. So I do think we'll be able to address some of that. Yes. Josh? Josh. Yeah, hey, um, just with respect to, just to um, expound upon what Nico was um, uh, describing as, as a need here, I think we have um, the ability to, um, you know, we, when, when we're comparing how our police are trained, we should be comparing that. There should be some benchmark or something. So is it possible for us to, to see how our police department is trained versus training uh, across the, 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 the country here? Like is our training equal to or better than or less, not as good as other, other places around the nation? Like what is the benchmark and where do we fit into that? Got it, Josh. Thanks. And then I guess like secondarily, um, to uh, expound somebody else, and I can't remember who it was, said something about needing um, some data. And I couldn't agree with that more. Um, love to get like data regarding specifically um, when there are incidents, when people are, whether it's whether people are pulled over or arrested or whatever the case may be, um, where are those and, and you know, why are they uh, occurring, um, particularly with respect to the uh, frequency and um, concentration of policing within that area versus the number of reports that are, um, that are, uh, that are cited. Um, so I think that could be helpful data as well. Great. Nico, did you have another question or did? Yeah. Um... My second one was about um, officers and like their policies with therapy or their mental health, um, their check-ins after um, use of force or shooting occurs um, and what the, what the procedures are for, for those kinds of situations. Great. All right, great. All right, was there anything else in regards to policies and procedures that anyone needed to have more information on before we move to the next the next level yeah just just wanted to flag any safeguards in place to look for patterns of um complaints or infractions or anything that raises concern okay all right i would also offer that um i know that we did we sent out you know in the email that we were going to do this but i i i recognize that um something might come to you later uh, or even a few weeks from now and there'll be a channel you know, open for you to say, oh, I wanna see this too. Um, and we'll certainly be working with the city to be as responsive as possible. Matthew. Uh, yeah, quick clarification question. Um, under policy 1020 personnel complaints, um, are those complaints made by personnel uh, members of the Modesto Police Department or complaints made by the public against personnel? I'm gonna defer to Aaron Tate on that, I believe. Yeah. Those are both citizen driven and administrative, administratively driven complaints. Okay, so both. Yep. Okay. Will we have, would we be able to have access to um, like the process of like how disciplinary action is, how the Modesto Police Department um, deals with these personnel complaints? Yeah, it's in the policy. Um, I also did an internal affairs audit, which is, it's not in here. So there's three audits that are missing out here that have been submitted. So you guys will have access to those. Thank you. All right. Okay. So we're going to go to the next one, which is the alternative response models. We're going to do the same thing here that we just done there. And so um, what information do you need in order to, to help you make um, an informed decision? I would just say that um, we have here listed some local programs that are currently in place. Plus we know that there's a lot of interest in the CAHOOTS program that we've heard about certainly in our council meetings and otherwise. Um, and then there are some current innovations that are taking shape um, that we would also 
ask for the county and local law enforcement to pro provide updates on. Um, Solange. Um, I'm sorry, I'm still on the first section. I'm slow. Okay. Um, the, the data that's going to be pro provided in connection with the policy and procedures, how far back is that going to go? Is it only going to go back a year, two years, three years, five years? How, how, how much data are we going to be provided? Um, I, so Aaron Tate or Chief Gillespie, I would invite you to weigh in. Um, these, these policies, yeah, these policies are the current policies and procedures. They're dictated through Lexipol, which is a um, company that does risk management assessments and guides policy and procedure throughout agencies that use these policies. Um, there, there was a, another standard called CLIA, which is more Eastern base of the United States. We went away from that. So we've gone over years of different policies and procedures, but these are the most current progressive policies that are currently being used. And then I'll um, invite the chief to weigh in and then um, I have a follow-up question for you, Solange, but Chief Gillespie, go ahead. Yeah, sure. Very good question. And uh, so a lot of our reports have different reporting uh, data. Some we do a three-year average, sometimes where we go back further. So that's a good question for the committee um, based on how far you want to see the data go back. And if we have it, then we'll definitely uh, do our best to provide it. But uh, I think as a committee, if you guys want to uh, come up with kind of what the wish list is as far as time frames, then we can definitely try to provide that if we can, if we can, if we have it. That's great. That was that was going to be my follow up question, which is, what would you want? Yeah, and just one other thing too for those I've seen some questions about these policies. They are on our website, so if you guys see other ones, you guys want to look at ahead of time. They're also on our website. Yes, and we will be. Um, posting any information that we make available to this committee will also be on the website for forward together. So um, the public will have access. Solange, did you have a year and like a number of years in mind or were you just? Well, I would, I would say if there are incidents and there are complaints and um, generally how long does it take for those to be resolved? Three years, a year, three years, five years, because depending on the length of time that they take to be resolved, I would, I would say we should go back uh, for that period that they're, they're left unresolved. Got it. So. Got it. Okay. If it's all right with folks, we will go now to the alternative response models. And again, we're gonna send an email. So if there's more stuff that comes up for you, please just communicate it with the city. So when we talk about alternative response models that ensure the right type of response and resources are applied to a situation, is there other things that you would wanna hear about? And this can be from the city, it could be from um, a presenter that you're aware of out in the world that has a good program that's working. I mean, there's lots of different things that we could offer this group. Yeah, Tom. Um, the name of it is completely slipping my mind, but I know that it, Stockton um, had that program where you're kind of looking at um, you know populations and areas uh, where you're kind of looking at the, the the social issues underlying you know why someone would feel the need to you know get involved in the drug trade or commit a specific act of violence was that because of a you know drug business dispute was it a family problem resolution and then kind of looking at targeted solutions of you know whether it's finding social programs or even employment or or things like that for those specific individuals and the the name is completely slipping my mind i could probably look it up quick but well it'll it'll probably come to you a little bit later when it does you um you can still send that to us. Uh, Leah Ashford and then Linda. I'd love to know any proactive activities the police force has to get to know young people in different communities, interactions they have, or, you know, I've heard of other places where they have barbecues or, you know, athletic things or whatever it might be just to help both sides get to know each other better. Mm -hmm. Got it, Linda. Yes, I, I would really like to look into um, alternate um, to the CAHOOTS program because I know there's uh, quite a few 
supposedly evidence-based programs uh, throughout the state or th the country for that matter. And um, so I think we, it would be wise to make some comparisons and <clears throat> see what would what might be offered somewhere that we might like better than the CAHOOTS program. Sure, excellent. And would also um, reiterate that certainly uh, we will do our work, we meaning myself, but also the city to bring forward information. And to the extent that, that some of you have that information or are interested in doing that research yourself, we welcome you to say, hey, here's some information, present on this or call that person and see if you can get them to come talk to us and so on. So. Inviting, I'm, inviting that. Great. I'm, Thanks. I've, been, I've heard of some, so I'm going to look into it. All Thanks, right. Linda. Solange and Dan Matthew. Uh, with respect to my unmuted, um, yeah. with respect to the current innovations through partnership with the county and local law enforcement, um, do you, you intend to provide information regarding drug treatment programs that? currently exist that perhaps have existed in the past, how those are working, and um, is there going to be an opportunity um, um, to survey um, law enforcement in the community about some of these um, models that maybe are being used or that have been used in the past? And, and you know, I'm, I'm just curious if there have been things that have been used in the past that were working well, that were discontinued, that, um, maybe we should be looking at again um, and revisit. Um, that's where I'm kind of going with, with this. Anyway, um, particularly in the area of drug treatment and rehabilitation. Got it. Matthew? You're muted. Thank you. Um, so in terms of like looking at the current innovations, well, we have access to um, various, the body cam footage from various uh, use of force instances, specifically um, like Xander Mann, Rudy Sin, Tian. Um, so in order to analyze like what the alternative responses are, we can see what the current response is to various situations where use of force has been used. All right. Okay. And Thomas and then Josh. Yeah, the, the program was called um, Advanced Peace. Okay. Um, and I'd also like to add in there um, also from, from Stockton, um, it's called Collaborative Courts. It more has to do with um, the courts, but police, local police do have to um, kind of be involved and, and have um, buy in to it, but I would throw that in there as well. Got it. And Josh? Uh, yeah, um, can you guys hear me? Yes. Okay, great. So yeah, I would love to, just to expound a little bit and uh, what Solange was um, referencing there, you know, with within our downtown area, um, which is the community that I particularly represent, um, we have, we definitely struggle with a lot of mental health and drug addiction um, and the types of, uh, you know, I, I think, Police aren't equipped to, nor should they be, in my opinion, um, um, respond to that. Um, they they sh they should maybe be a part of that that uh, part of the response team, but there's needs to be a larger team that is that is engaged in that in that the solutions to those uh, those issues. And um, and so to the extent that I think this almost encompasses or necessitates a review of the larger system. Um, not just policing, but we can't understand how police should respond if we don't understand how the other parts of the system that are or are not in place are providing um, the meaningful tools and, um, and provisions to deal with um, the, the, the mental health and drug addiction issues that are plaguing um, us largely in this community and, and, the, and, and, and the nation as a whole. Right. Thanks, Josh. Really excellent point. Um, Solange? Um, he, what Josh just said is exactly what, uh, okay. where I, what I wanted to raise. And, um, you know, at the outset of this, um, you know, it, it was indicated somewhere that some of the things we'll, we would be looking at wouldn't necessarily be addressed at the local level, that they might, 
some of these these issues need to be addressed at the state or the state level. And um, and you know, I'd like us to get that information. So if we need to pursue, you know, if there's a part of this group that wants to pursue further action at the state level, that we go forward with that. Um, we understand. Now I want to. I want to actually just offer as an example, Solange, because I think you bring up a really great point on, on the heels of what Josh um, offered, which is that when we think about what kinds of recommendations might might arise from this group, um, active roles and advocacy might be something that we're coming to some, you know, that we think there's a role for us to play in, you know, at, at the either certainly the local level, but and beyond. Um, so I think that I can see a lot of things taking shape as a recommendation that you give back to the city council. Um, I want to just call out that it's 7.35. Um, we have two more slides to go through and then I also need to open this up for public comment. Um, so Linda, I'm gonna invite you to offer your comments and then I'm gonna move us. I, I just had a question when we were talking about policies and procedures, we found out that these, they're available on the, on the web and I was wondering if these different elements that you have on this slide, are those um, programs available to read about or learn about on the web? Yeah, I think in most cases, I can also say that if you started to Google some of these things, Stanislaus County or City of Modesto, that you would find information on these programs. Great question, Linda, thanks. Yes. All right, so we're gonna move to the final section, which is accountability. Um, so I would just offer, um, and I did see uh, that we had a, in the Q and A, um, a request for a presentation by the National Association for Civilian Oversight of Law Enforcement, which we are planning to do. So um, that is something that will bring forward also information on the internal investigation process and how that works with Modesto Police Department and then other kinds of civilian oversight models. Um, one thing that I wanna make very clear and certainly not advocating for or against anything, but what the cities ask us to review here is accountability for police conduct decisions and how they impact the Modesto community. And we know that civilian oversight uh, boards has been something that uh, people have been talking about for a long time and it is one way or one story that folks have about achieving accountability. So I'm only wanting to just expand our thinking um, that if there are other models or other things that we could be looking at, other ways to increase accountability, that's the question here. Um, we just know that the civilian oversight is definitely something people are interested in. Mr. Helm, yes. Uh, yeah, and in full transparency, somebody mentioned earlier, I was also in that the, the local ACLU chapter was also part of a group that looked at um, some of these um, alternatives um, and we actually had a town hall um, virtually, you can look it up on YouTube, um, members of NACOL were involved. And part of that um, also looking at a review board was also looking at the role of uh, an independent auditor. Um, and something I, I feel like I also have to mention as somebody, you know, I report back to the board of the local ACLU chapter um, because they're the ones who elected me to represent them on this. And it was mentioned, and I do see that oversight is, is on there, that um, the, the question that I got was, why isn't it called accountability and oversight? Some people saw that as two different things. Accountability can kind of be like after something has happened. Uh, and I think Will, it was Will that mentioned earlier, like looking for patterns, oversight is something that could kind of prevent something from happening. Um, so I just wanted to make that distinction um, and because it was specifically brought up by our, our board on, you know, what they wanted to see out of, out of the group. So I'm glad to see that, you know, oversight presentation is on there. Um, I would add independent auditor and, and uh, people can go on and check out the town hall if they want to, you know, do a little research on their, their own time. It was good conversation, um, had, had somebody that was an independent auditor and had a lot of background and experience in that. Excellent. Thanks. Excellent. Thanks so Thanks. much. Was there any other feedback for this particular section? Anything else that you needed to see in regards to accountability? And again, if nothing comes to mind now and something comes up later, you, um, you'll have access to being able to, to share that um, and to still receive that learning. 
And so I guess we can move on. Okay, so the very last thing that I would just, oh, Matthew, yes, please. Sorry, quick question. Um, mm -hmm. On the NACL presentation on citizens review boards, will that just be, we'll be getting information from, or would we possibly be able to get a representative from them to come tell us about citizen review boards? Because I've read some scholarly articles about citizen review boards, but it'd be really nice to like hear from someone who has all of it. Yeah, yeah. The I think the intention wouldn't just be for you to like get you know documents explaining it, but that we would um, either have somebody join us virtually uh, because they are an East Coast organization, so uh, we could potentially have them join us virtually. But there are other groups that are also interested in a presentation from NACOL, so we'll we'll see. This will be coming in our December meeting, so we have a minute to try to figure that all out. Yes. Great question. Yeah. Okay, so let me offer just one more thing. Um, so just in terms of general information, which I think this has come up a little bit and I'm tracking all of what people are saying. And I also know that Leslie with the city is sitting with Edgar is also taking notes. Um, we are also gonna make available again to this group and also on the website, um, there's a countywide effort that was initiated by the Sheriff's Department designed very differently than this. Um, but there was a completed a community-wide survey on trust and, and relationships between community and law enforcement that has some data that we'll make available to this whole group. Um, it's been a made, made available to the public. You can Google that too, um, but we'll make sure that we can disaggregate the data about Modesto and otherwise and make that available. During the search for um, our police chief, the city conducted two surveys, one of um, input from the department and then a, another gathering input from the community. The results of those surveys will also be made available to you. And then you can see that we'll be including um, some audits here that I think Aaron Tate had alluded to um, around bias-based policing, internal affairs, use of force, um, as well as the Peace Officers Bill of Rights and some demographic information from the department on their staff. So one last call for things that you feel like you'd like, not, I shouldn't have said it that way. Um, <laughs> yeah. In this moment, if there's anything else that you'd like to ask for, uh, please do so. Um, otherwise you'll have plenty of other opportunities, but we can start designing the next three meetings based on what you've said today. Right. Thanks for all of the feedback. Um, we do have Matthew, your hand. Um, yes, so all of this, like the 2020 bias-based place, bias -based policing audit and the internal affairs audit, this is all specific to uh, MPD, correct? Yes. Awesome, thank you. So we need to go ahead and open up, uh, okay, wait, hold on, Solange, yes. Um, were, was that, um, were those audits, the bias-based audit, the internal affairs audit, the use of for, force audit, were those just um, started in 2020 or do we have any that go back further than that? They, they go back further than that. But these are more comprehensive than the ones that were previously done. So these, these are way more comprehensive than the ones that were pr produced back in 2016, 2017, I believe. Would it be possible to get them going back to three to five years? Yeah, whatever we have, we can um, provide. Thank you. Excellent. Thanks. Okay, so we need, whoop, I just accidentally muted Mike. I was <coughs> pushing buttons on my mouse too fast. Um, we need to open this up for public comments. So uh, based on this sort of what information you wanna see, I wanna just assure folks who used the Q&A, thank you that we are tracking the questions that you also added to this conversation. Um, but if you would at this time like to make public comment in regards to this agenda item, what information we'll be presenting over the next three months, please go ahead and use the raise your hand function. I would also just mention that the email address and Yep. Okay, Bianca, I'm coming to you. The email address and the website are ways that you can also ask for this information. And we um, will, as we've declared, be taking emails that come in and so on and make them available to the work group um, so that they can see everything that comes through in that way too. Okay, Bianca, we're going to do three minutes. Um, 
unfortunately, our tech support on the city side is uh, having some technical issues. So I'm going to revert back to what we had planned on in the beginning. I'll raise my hand at three minutes. Um, I'm sorry, I'll raise my hand when you have 30 seconds left, but we'll start with three minutes. Um, yes, thank you. So I'd like to, uh, you mentioned that you will be reviewing or sharing uh, the survey that the sheriff and his committee came up with. Obviously, um, I don't agree with the survey. I think it was very biased and um, distributed it in a very unequitable way. So when you present it, I hope that um, it, become, it comes with a critique and not just as um, authority, like give it authority. Um, it needs to be really um, critiqued. I, I just don't want it to be accepted as if it was a really good survey because it was not. Um, and I'd like to hear from the committee that was part of that and not the sheriff. Um, and um, obviously, yeah, I don't know. It, it's, I don't know why you're presenting that. Um, the sheriff has no accountability to the public. Um, that's, that survey was just to make him look good and uh, make his office and department look good. Uh, that's all I needed to say. I, it, I don't understand why you would share that. Thanks. Okay, thanks. Thank you, Bianca. I think there was one other name um, that may have raised his hand. Kevin Valine, he raised and lowered, lowered his hand. I don't know if he had a comment. I think we can, um, I'm gonna bring Darlene Ruiz into the room for three minutes. Darlene, I'll raise my hand when you have 30 seconds left. And then I'll trust that Kevin, if you are wanting to um, add anything that you'll raise your hand and we can bring you in then. Hello. Hi, Darlene. How are you? Doing fine. What, yeah. what would you like to share? Um, I would like to, um, I would really love to see uh, Modesto get an independent police auditor um, at the town hall meeting that Tom was talking about. We had Michael Janaco come and talk and he is an independent police auditor. I think it's important that we don't have police auditing themselves. And until we want to get to the root of the problem, um, we need to uncover what's wrong. I mean, you know that my son Trevor was murdered and La Matia has killed four other people before they killed, before he killed Trevor. And I just want to see some real change and not candy coat things. I want, uh, I think Michael Janaco has done Davis, um, Portland, Los Angeles and Anaheim and Chicago. Um, there are plenty of data. We've spoken to him. He'd be willing to talk to the group and give data on how they've made changes in the other cities. And I just hope this committee would be willing to uncover what's been wrong and we can make it better. Thank you. Thanks, Thank you, darling. Okay. Um, it looks like Kevin raised his hand by mistake. So is there okay. anyone else in our audience who's interested in making public comment at this time? Okay. So um, I'm just gonna offer a couple of updates and then I'm gonna give it to Mike to close us out for tonight. Um, just a reminder that our next meeting is October 18th. Uh, I know that we did a doodle poll for try to land on the best dates that we could for a group of this size and our competing schedules. So um, we'll make sure that these are available if folks can't make it for some reason, but we do hope that you're able to prioritize this in your calendars. Um, we'll be working to pull together the presentation on policies and procedures. It's our very, very, it's very much our hope that we can meet in person, um, at, of course, safely, uh, but we'll, we'll keep an eye on, on whether or not that's a possibility moving forward. Um, and yeah, Mike, I'm going to throw this over to you. All right. So first, I want to open any space for anybody that has any questions or reflections before we um, shut it down for tonight. And if you do, we want to try to keep your questions and your reflections um, kind of brief so that everyone that might want to share will have an opportunity to share. Matthew, your thoughts? Uh, just a 
housekeeping thing. I know I know that we were originally going to be meeting on the third Tuesday evenings of the month. Um, are we now going to be moving to Monday evenings? Yes, the only at least. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Kate. No, go, go Mike. Well, no. I just, that's what we used the doodle poll because the Tuesdays became such a conflict because of the um, Board of Supervisors meetings and um, some other things that, that was brought to our attention by some of our work group committee members. And so um, we did the doodle poll to try to land on at least the next bit of meetings and Mondays worked. We will be revisiting that calendar uh, for the new calendar year so we can try to pick the best date for everyone. Perfect, thank you. Josh, your thoughts. Yeah, yeah. I just uh, wanted to say I'm encouraged by this group and all the uh, thoughtful comments that were provided tonight. And I wanted to say that, you know, I think everybody here takes this very seriously. We want to see a, a better tomorrow for our community, which is why we're all volunteering our time uh, to go through this process together and to listen um, and to really consider one another's perspectives, um, thoughts and feelings. I think we come um, with the hope of, of, of building something better together and, and being um, obviously bringing to bear our own experiences and perspectives, but again, taking and respecting and taking into consideration everybody else's at the same time um, so that we can build something better together. Excellent, really appreciate that. You know, before we go, I just really want us to take a, a moment to really consider the magnitude of the work that you have been asked to do and for us to come to the table and to leave the table with compassion for each other, with respect for each other's point of view and position, and, and, and just the knowing that we all come in with the same agenda in mind, and that is being able to cultivate a, a community that we all will enjoy living in and seeing our children and grandchildren and future children raised in these areas. You know, So with that said, Kate, do you have any final thoughts? Just wanted to express some appreciation. You'll notice here, and again, we'll send this out in an email that you, uh, if you are interested and we'd encourage it um, as a way to deepen our um, education, you can go on a ride along uh, with the Modesto Police Department um, by emailing Ruth. She's expecting emails from work group uh, committee members. So if that's something you wanna do, and then also we'll provide an opportunity for you to participate in uh, what's called the forced option simulator. Um, so that, that is all coming by email. But mostly I would just echo what Mike has said. Um, I have nothing but gratitude and appreciation for all of you just for making the time. It's been a long evening. We've got a lot of work ahead of us, um, but hopeful like Josh. Yes, yes. You know, um, I also wanna you know, say, uh, you know, the, the, the ad hoc committee that, that was formed from individuals from amongst the work group did a lot of hard work together to get to a place um, to bring in some, um, some additional phenomenal community members. And I just really wanna commend them for their ability to work together and to come to that resolution. And uh, it's obvious that those individuals who have been selected have already yielded you know, some really good feedback. And so we just really wanna to continue to commit to the process and be the change that we wanna see in the community. Right? Just be the change that you wanna see. And with that, I want to wish you a very restful and peaceful evening and thank you and we'll see you next time.